Hi, my name is Raj Sampath, and I'm here with my colleague, Joel Christensen. And I thought to myself that maybe um, he and I can spend just a few minutes sharing our perspectives and views over a tumultuous set of months, for some of us perhaps years, compounded by the insecurity of the, the pandemic. We're both faculty members in higher ed here in the United States. We're of a certain generational bracket, Gen X. And um, what I'm gonna do is have Joel introduce himself and I'll introduce myself. And the subject of today's discussion is, what is systematic racism in American higher education? And what could strategies, initiatives, or maybe short of that, if we can't crystallize it in one conversation, it would be impossible to do so. What's our mindset when we think about an ethos of what an anti-racist uh, framework could look like in, in higher education from the standpoint of two faculty members? And we're only speaking on behalf of ourselves and our own personal views. So I will let Joel introduce himself first, and then I'll pose two questions, or actually I already did but if I'm sure he's a very bright guy. He can recall what I said, but I'll, I'll, I'll restate it just for the audience. But Joel, please introduce yourself and then we'll just dive right in. Hi, Joel Christensen, um, professor of classical studies. Uh, so perhaps not the most likely person to be in this conversation, uh, but I think I'm probably one of the people who needs to be. Um, so, so that I think we'll just start with that, classical studies. Uh, I appreciate Joel's beneficence, his allyship, his empathy, and I know you, and I know you're a strong, ardent uh, supporter of social justice. So it's good maybe to speak from within the humanities. I come from within the humanities, and I'm actually in a policy school, a graduate school of social policy. So I guess, Joel, my first question will be, again, what to you is systematic racism in the 21st century, two decades into it? And given your years of experience as a faculty member in, high, in American higher ed, what can an anti-racist framework look like? Well, you know, Raj, we've had this conversation on many levels as long as we've known each other. And I think one of the things that we see eye to eye on is the need to sort of start with base definitions, right? And so you just asked me sort of like five different questions. So let's start with systematic racism because I'm not sure that everybody believes in it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it may take us to a conclusion that I'm really trying to work through myself. Mm -hmm. um, so as I understand it, and I want to make it very clear, I have no expertise to talk on the subject. Um, it's just from reading, from conversations, from observations over the years. You know, um, systemic racism is a part of our life to such a degree that we don't notice it like the air we breathe. All right, so one of the metaphors that Raj and I, that I used with Raj earlier is trying to make a non, an anti-racist place in a racist society is like trying to create, say, a chlorine gas-based life form in the middle of an oxygen-based ecology, right? The two things just don't work. As I understand it, um, systemic racism is so pervasive in our society. It's been there before we even came to the North American continent. And it shaped almost everything we've done as a people. It's really at the core of our nation. I think that's one of the hardest things that's for especially white people to understand is that most of our wealth and our prosperity is rooted in racist policies and practices from the um, wide scale and planned genocide and theft from uh, indigenous peoples uh, to the plan to use slave labor and enslave peoples um, to create uh, our wealth, right? I mean, as a student of history, I know that there's no empire that's ever been made without slave labor. It's just that way, right? And this is a naive view of economics, um, but you don't get wealth in anything other but two ways. Either you take resources from other people that don't belong to you, or you steal somebody's life, right? You use their wage and their time um, to make excess for you. So wealth is made from asymmetry, right? Um, feudalism is a type of asymmetry. The Roman Empire was a different type. Um, and our particular modern type is based on stealing land killing people and enslaving others, right? So that, that's a pretty wretched history to deal with. And the problem is that our laws, our social structures are based on a race-based slavery that people haven't been able to get out of, right? So people will talk about, oh, slavery hasn't been around for 150 years, which is a lie because we have a whole set of laws and systems and customs that enforce um, 
that enforce our, our race system. And it's really hard. I think one of the reasons why we deny it so much um, is in the aggregate, it's hard for individuals to see. But a couple numbers make it real easy for me to see the impact of this over time and right now. And these are the numbers I try to get people to see. The first one is $8. $8 is the average wealth of a black family in Boston. Okay, $8. And an average um, wealth of a white family is in the mm -hmm. tens, of, if not hundreds of thousands. Um, and that's not accidental. Right? That's because of policies over time that have marginalized people, have broken families, and have prevented the accumulation of wealth. Another number that I think about is 75%. 75% are the number of black students in Texas who are suspended from school before they get out of high school. All right? That is a staggering number. Um, because aggregate, it means you're missing class time, you're treated differently, um, and uh, you uh, miss out on opportunities other people have. So if you look at like a whole combination, if we could just say a couple things, if you don't have access to family health, if you have a series, sorry, family wealth, if you have a series of laws that keep you from gaining wealth, education, change to society, from any type of equality. Um, and then we also know now that emotional, physical health trauma can actually be passed down genetically, right? Two generations. Um, so one, we know that trauma affects your health. Race trauma affects your health. And you can inherit it over time. So if you look at the things that we care about as human beings, right? To have our families, to have friends, to have health, to have access to the goods. Every one of these things has been denied to a group of people systematically for hundreds of years because of their race. And we can't deny it. So that's systematic racism, like, and I'm missing so many aspects of it, but the basic thing is, if I, 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 I am only doing well now because I, of the way I was born, right? There are plenty of people who are smart who don't make it. There's lots of chance in life. Um, but if you really look at just sheer statistics, uh, my whiteness, my heteronormative um, appearance and lifestyle, um, and the fact that my family was Protestant in the Northeast when they came over in 1910 has really shaped where I've been and what I could achieve in the world. Um, and to understand that, you need to have an understanding of history, of large scale aggregate events, um, and you need to have empathy. So that's the first question, Raj, and we can push on some of these things. Um, and you know, I've just told a picture that's black and white. Of course, you add in indigenous people, Asian Americans, South Asians, um, Latinx people, and it gets messier, but it's also the same story which is that the American story is a story of white supremacy. Uh, that's just it at the end. And I, I think that I need to say that strongly. And people who look like me need to say it and keep saying it and not take the easy way out. So my family will say, well, we weren't here for slavery. It's not our responsibility, right? But you can't, I can't deny I benefited from it, right? And that's a critical thing to understand. You can't deny that <laughs> we still, doors still open. When I leave my name, on answering machines, we don't have those anymore, on voicemails, people answer. When I send my emails and I have my title and my name, people answer. When I walk into restaurants, staff listens, right? All this, you know, we have words for this, right? White privilege, white fragility. People don't like the names because it makes you uncomfortable because it points out that you didn't earn what you have. And this is another thing I really want to mention is that American rhetoric about earned meritocracy and about worth is sick, right? It's a toxic story that says, if you're wealthy, it's because you earned it. And if you're not, if you suffer, it's because you deserved it. Um, and this is a type of narrative system. It's a discourse that keeps us all trapped, right? Again, uh, racism, the sooner we have to realize we have to do something. So the second question you asked, is what does it mean to be in a institution um, shaped by systematic racism, right? And so here's what I've been thinking about, Raj, every day. If you have a house, and you like the house well enough, but it's not perfect, but the foundation is rotten to the core, what do you do, right? I mean, because changing in a foundation is a hard job, 
You got to bring in a whole crew. You got to lift the house. It's fabulously expensive. You got to build a new foundation. And the thing is, like, in a human institution, isn't a house. One person didn't design it. It's an organic creation, right? It's like a tree that's grown up. You can't cut the middle out of the tree and just replace it and expect it to live. So my crisis of faith, Raj, is that we can't actually do anything better than the terrible, expensive, and painful triage of lifting up the house and replacing the foundation. And when we do that, when we do that, we're still left with the structure that was built for and by racism. We finished the puzzle. Right? Okay. Hold, on, hold on a second. I've been interrupting. Okay. A welcome to interruption. Yeah. So, and that's where we are. I mean, I, you know, as, as someone who deals in myth and literature, I'm always thinking about the metaphors, right? How to think around the things that we have. And maybe there's a metaphor, maybe there's a way of understanding the problem that will free us of the trap that I just thought of. But all of our academic fields, pretty much, are based around racist structures the way we cite, the way we promote, the way we teach our educational system, right, from the ground up. Um, and I don't know how you fix that, All right? So I wanna have these conversations so maybe I could find some things, but my real fear is that we can mitigate the pain and the effect on people. Um, but we're one, we're one house in a city of broken homes. And I, can I pause you there on, on such a compelling metaphor and analogy about one house in a city of houses of which the entire foundation is problematic. What I'd like to do now is just, you gave us this very compelling global, historically informed perspective. And in, our, in the next iteration, after I finish my remarks, my question will be back to you is, you know, we have to start with the contemporary, the historical present. And by that, I mean what you just laid out from antiquity through colonization, the indigenous genocide, the enslavement of black people, to Jim Crow, civil rights, its erosion, BLM. You know, when we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion in higher ed, and there's a succession, it seems to me, from Trayvon Martin, one succession after another, every year since the beginning of President Obama's second term, leading to the election of uh, Donald Trump that there's been a succession of shocks in higher ed and every single time we're trying to react to them. If we fast forward to the present, in a, in a BLM has really moved so far beyond basic protection of human life and holding systems of criminal justice and justice uh, accountable to an actual war about toppling the entire system. And that means something threefold when students talk about defunding the police, not just reforming it, when states come forward, whether Republican or Democrat, they come forward with these initiatives about implicit bias training, diversification of the workforce, um, you know, holding police accountable for their own actions within the system when they're obviously naturally privileged, to a completely different view of what's necessary, speaking to your issue about foundations. So I wanna telescope you back to this question of higher ed the parameters of thinking around ethical responsibility for faculty members who have the privilege to speak up, those of us that do address these issues in our classroom, those of us, for example, me as a, as a person of color within the faculty, but those of us that may have institutional responsibilities of some form or another when it comes to shared governance, something you've been leading and thinking about, that there, the onus really is on uh, those of us that truly believe we can bridge theory and practice, they're exemplar scholar activists from Angela Davis's generation up to Cornell West, but we're really talking about the exigency, you mentioned this, the exacerbation of inequality in society, and the quote, a famous Martin Luther King quote, protests and riots are, a, it, it's, it's a cry from the most oppressed, essentially. It's when silence the silent oppressed start to vocalize themselves. And that's the mechanism to speak out against the intensification of racial oppression. So I guess the next set of questions, and, and, and we can kind of go back and forth here. I mentioned the ethical parameters of thinking what the boundaries are and how we can creatively perhaps transgress them in our roles as faculty members. We're told we can't speak on behalf of the institution. And 
we get protected in terms of our scholarship to within our fields to speak about pretty much anything. That should be the principle of free expression. And for the most part, it is protected. Not always. There is backlash and repercussion for a lot of faculty of color when the lines are blurred. But the one thing we can't do is even in the role of leaders within coming out of the faculty, but stepping into roles of leadership, there are still these very tenuous boundaries with regard to the acceleration of institutional transformation. So that, I think this could transition us to the next conversation. I'd love to get your comments and perspectives in your, and if you want to talk about your various roles in the university, you are a professor of classics, but you have other roles as well. We're almost six to eight years behind a number of student movements that I said began in 2012, roughly 2014 Ferguson. 2015 was a pivotal year for a lot of occupations across various universities. You can speak to various regions in the country because you've worked and lived in them. Now you're here in the Northeast. And then the post, you know, first term of Trump, and then everything that we're seeing now that's unfolding. To take a myopic view and to compartmentalize DEI and higher ed as somebody else's responsibility, or perhaps a top-down model of some kind of organ that exists every university, unless they don't live in the 21st century, has a chief diversity officer, the special burden of responsibility that's put on just single institutions that can only do what's humanly possible. And the so few faculty of color in R1 universities, I'm just gonna say, let's just say the top 50 that are ranked in US News and World Report. So research universities, liberal arts colleges that are ranked at the highest. I don't need to throw out the numbers. You already know them instinctively. But the demands for at least the least represented in what would be the pipeline of graduate school all the way to tenure line faculty positions. Of those that have gotten their PhDs, let's say in the last one to five years, the pipeline and the translation into hiring has been so minuscule, as you said, for several groups, not just one, predominantly African-American, but I'm thinking Latinx, I'm thinking Native American peoples, I'm thinking transnational folks that are facing, you know, this highly volatile and highly unpredictable set of policies that come out of this particular administration. But we can't be insular. And there's only so much leadership can do to absorb the external shocks of the policymakers at the state level and then the national level and then the global level. We understand that, we empathize with that, we work with them. On the other hand, I'm hearing the voices, the silent voices that are now roaring about how we are so late and so pushed to the brink. And I want to get your views. Maybe we can come up with some concrete examples to talk about. Two things I want us to address from our different disciplines. I'd love to hear from the, a specialist in antiquity. I can speak more about the philosophical interpretation of racial justice and something called critical race theory. Everybody could be dismayed and appalled by the fact that they see these social movements today, particularly the erasing of historical memory, the mythification of white male glory, and it doesn't really matter what the statue actually symbolizes. Everybody's going after the Confederate legacy of the South. That seems to be a no brainer. But then there's this white fragility in the masses on the liberal side, the Republican side, et cetera, when they start to see communities of color protesting just the symbolism of every white male statue, depending, regardless of where they're placed in the country. It could be George Washington, Oregon, or a Lincoln statue here in the Northeast. How are you, from your perspective, which you said has to come from your perspective of privilege that you were born with, not by merit, it was by luck, it's your strategy for disprivileging. What is your view on this question of the physical transformation of historical memory and the justification, if there is one, for what people are doing with regard to these statues and why is that important for higher ed? It's not just a question of the public sphere. It's something that should matter to us. What's your view on that? I'll give you mine, and then we can move to the next phase. For our well, I wanna ask a question and then give one answer and then go back to the question. And the question I've been asking myself for the past two weeks is how is a canon like a statue? Okay. Um, and I think that the statues aren't history. The fact that they were put up, most of the Confederate ones, two generations after the end of the Civil War. The fact that they were put up in public spaces as a way to terrorize and as a way to enforce a particular view of history. 
only reinforces the fact that they have to come down, right? And I'm gonna spread this around, statues of Columbus, just take them down, right? We know Columbus was a bad dude. Um, and we also know that history, it's not history that we're talking about. And this is the rhetorical ploy that people are getting away with. Well, we're talking about social memory and social identity. And we've had a small percentage of the population um, allowing itself to, uh, or sorry, enforcing its own view of social identity on a majority, right? Um, and this, uh, this social memory, this social identity has been a violent and terrorizing one. Putting up statues of slavers is a way of asserting a particular view of the world. And that's nonsense. So let the statues come down. Okay, and I think it's important to understand that, that of course statues can change meaning. I have a great little story I like to tell. And when my daughter, who's three, uh, who's sorry, 10 now, when she was three, she came up to me with a quarter. And she's like, Daddy, look, it's Barack Obama. Now everybody <laughs> knows Barack Obama is not on the quarter, right? And if you look at, if I look at the quarter, this is a phenotypically white image, mm -hmm. right? Um, but my daughter at that age, who comes from a biracial household and who had been in a multiracial community and saw a Barack Obama on the wall of her preschool every day, mm -hmm. wasn't as, was seeing the whiteness as power, but was renaming that power with this name Barack Obama and conflating the two. So the one positive thing I see is we do have the opportunity to change things rather quickly if we're willing to bring the statues down, right? Um, but then this, of course, takes me to my own complicity, right? To that first question, how is a canon like a statue, right? Mm -hmm. I teach the classical tradition. I teach Homer. Um, and for the longest time, the justification for teaching these things was the Western tradition. And the whole idea of the Western tradition is a creation of nationalist European countries and, and you know, the Americas um, in order to enforce a particular worldview in which European and your American countries are the apex of human civilization, sort of uh, pushing everything else out to the side. I'm not saying there's no utility still or importance in teaching what I teach, but what I am saying um, is what we value aesthetically, what we value historically communicates a message about what our future is going to look like and what we value in the present. And I think that we need to be willing to help students bring the statues down. We need to be willing to help students and learn from them about the future that they need to build. Um, because as you point out all the time, um, they're demographically the future, right? And they're also, they're right. The present. I feel that. Yeah, they're the present. Um, so I think that one of the reasons this is gonna be hard for all of us institutionally and personally um, is that we're winners in a bankrupt system. Hmm. And to change the system, we have to give up our winnings. Uh, and most of us are too locked in to do it. Um, and so that's gonna be hard. I'm gonna ask you a subset in response to everything you said. I want you to think about the counter argument that's so mainstream so entrenched, both conscious and unconscious, explicit and implicit. Talk about structural systematic racism in society, which we have, or which higher ed is lodged within as, a, as, a, as an institution of society. But now I'm gonna take us in the world we live. We have to live, breathe this water in this air that you're talking about. Counter arguments have always been, for example, I'm not gonna name the reference, but one paradigm is that if you look back at a all white male or predominantly all white male collegiate, of both students and certainly faculty in the 60s, there was a complete defense of free expression, what's called the Bernie Sanders generation. Free expression and student protest against the Vietnam War. Maybe the majority of whites, given so few African Americans back then in higher ed, and still a question of the pipeline today, but white male students in allyship with regard to Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement. So they talked about inequality, they talked about civil rights, they talked about the sexual revolution, but these were white men predominantly speaking against their internal institution about outside forces. Fast forward to today, we hear from students of color, intersectional minorities, queer folks, people with disabilities, transnational folks, I'm thinking of DACA, thank goodness the Supreme Court defended it, but I'm talking about those types of interstitial identities 
whose voices do not find their way either in the institutional dialogue about DEI or within the canon when our faculty is not diverse. And therefore the thinking about the diversification of canon in relationship to this demographic change never really occurs. So the counter argument is it's one thing for a social protest inside higher education which is supposed to be the, the incubator of all future thinking, either scientific discovery or the generation of knowledge or the creative production, the artistic production of knowledge, that it's okay to summon the forces to protest the outside. But what happens when all that outside forces become internalized and now students are speaking about an internal critique within the institution and are highly diverse. And when they say it, they mean it. You talked about the impairment of people's ability to survive in the course of a lifetime due to racial trauma. Not just the microaggressions, not just the fight for the safe spaces, and not just the typical or perhaps atypical, depending on the institution, cry for more, for more diversity of faculty and diversification of the canon. I am talking about a legitimate, authentic, you think of this as a classicist, I think about this as a philosopher ethically, what are the, what are the conditions that talk about an authentic dialogue that meets the students where they are in a progressive vision for an anti-racist platform. So the, the critique is inward. How we, how are we still not able to muster a compelling dialogue with this generation so they feel like we're in communion about a common set of goals? I mean, because we will never be able to be radical enough to meet the students where they need to be, right? What does that mean? Well, we're talking about a generation that's not just much more highly conscious of intersectional identities and more respectful of the need to give space to these and acknowledge them. We're also talking about a generation that's witnessed one of the widest um, changes, greatest changes in inequality in a lifetime mm -hmm. and the uh, most rapid change in the way we communicate. Um, there's an extent to which they're cognitively different from older generations and they have less reason to support the status quo because they've seen all this change and the rich have gotten richer and they stayed pretty damn white. So when I look at the problem and I look at it, you know, again, back to asymmetries, right? Um, our students, our younger generation has less power and influence than before. Uh, and most of the time when we meet them, we're not meeting them um, anywhere close to the same space because we may be willing to have an open dialogue, um, but they have very little power and we have a lot and we're not willing to give it up. And that's what it comes down to. Um, so the first question you asked about free speech, right? Free speech in the sixties, most of the people speaking up uh, were white people, you know, who white had, the, they weren't gonna lose. Like what did they have to lose, right? Mm -hmm. If you think about a zero sum game, they gained by speaking out in social power, right? But they didn't lose anything in economic opportunities, um, uh, identity opportunities, sexual opportunities, if anything, everything was opening up, right? So they're in power now, by the way. That generation. Yeah, they're in power now and they're totally screwing it up, right? Um, so look, people get upset about free speech when their speech is impinged upon, right? Um, and when in the 60s, I'm sorry, a lot of people who got to speak with those already in power. Now we're talking about communities who represent different experiences and points of view than those are in power. But at the base of it, Raj, and I don't know, maybe we can, you can guide me to some solution to this. Um, I think we have an ultimate aporia, um, which is that the world, the new generation needs, the just world, may not be reconcilable with the universities we have in this world. And that's my real worry, right? I honestly, like you asked questions before about the things we can do at the school, um, I think the best we can do is benevolent incremental change uh, because the bigger system is so huge. And I'm gonna go back to another metaphor here. Do you tear down your house because you hate the city you live in? And sometimes maybe you do, right? And so we have to think about what is it that an institution does? Can we do enough good to justify the evil we perpetuate as we wait for a better world to come? Um, and I don't know, right? And right now, what we're talking about, we're talking about biggest social and financial economic change in our lifetime, right? Someone joked online, 
They wanted to know what it was like to live in the race riots of the 60s, the Spanish flu, and the Great Depression. And boom, we've got it, right? Institutions are going to fall. And the question is, who's going to be there to make sure that we keep track of these issues? So for now, it's all crisis management. And we have to keep, our, we have to keep raising these issues. We have to keep fighting for them. Um, but at some point, we have to save ourselves to fight in the long run. Right. right. So I think for you, the answer is we have to take seriously the ethical commitment of what it means to, to have someone in our community and to understand that we all enter this community mutilated mm -hmm. by the racism that we're raised with in different ways. We have different needs. And we have to come up with some sort of systematic treatment and inoculation to help us live better together and give each other better lives. And I don't know if 8,000 people, 10,000 people is enough to do that well. Um, and, and so that's really where I end up at. Like, so my last question for both of us, I'm gonna do a quick response to you and then segue into my last question. You get, um, uh, I know we have to wrap up probably in about 10 or 15 minutes. I'll just quickly close out the session at, at that point. Carol Anderson's work at, at Emory University, the book is called White Rage 2017. And I don't want to simplify her thesis, but in a nutshell, 500 page work into to 10 seconds. The, the white liberal response, forget about the white nationalists or the conservatives that are extremely you know, nationalized with regard to what America is as predominantly white and should be as such, and therefore resist at all costs any kind, as you said, change in the system with regard to, to equity and, and quite frankly, reparations. I'm talking about the liberal democratic side. They're gassed when they see um, black rioting and protesting and violence and looting and, and black communities tearing themselves apart in response to yet another police shooting of an unarmed black man. And her ingenious argument is that if we go deep, not just into the history, but the psychosis of what's happening right now in whiteness, that in fact, what, you're, what we may perceive as this black violence and rage is being fueled by a white rage it's not the white rage of slavers that need to control every single aspect of black and brown life. It's not the segregation of public, of public space and Jim Crow. It's a new modality of both fear and rage that that is a reaction to as opposed to something self-contained. The only reason I bring this up is because it looks like it's an outside matter. I want to bring this back inside the institution. The perception could be for every year, as I mentioned, at least as far as I can recall, I started my position in 2011, but already after Ferguson, I was in the middle of a lot of discussions. You got here a few years ago. Um, and there was an occupation movement in the 15s, as I mentioned, 2015s for a lot of institutions. Bringing it back inside the institution. On the one hand, there is sometimes a pervasive misperception of what's actually happening inside our reality, unless you're generationally proximate to what this new diverse group are actually thinking and feeling. You, you, you work and live with them in solidarity. Of course, we maintain our boundaries as faculty members, but we listen, we try to iterate, we change, we respond, we are, put ourselves out there in, in public you know, situations where we can make ourselves vulnerable, quite frankly. So changing the ethos, so to speak, requires a new modality of listening and thinking and speaking. I wanna get back to something near and dear to us, which is my, my last question to you. You mentioned the canon, and those of us that are in the humanities, in my case, my appointment's in a school of social policy where I teach theories of justice and ethics and rights, but you know me, my grounding is in the humanities, and, and my colleagues know that as well. You're squarely in the humanities. You're talking about Greco-Roman antiquity, in your case, Greek antiquity, and the founding playwright, writer, thinker, poet of, of the Western identity, Homer. We learned that as kids, right, growing up. Diversification of the canon in a superficial sense does not just mean the attempt to retrieve within that space hidden voices that are still buried under the layers of history. In your case, it's archaeological. I'll take my case. Of course, I grew up at least from the age of 15 when I read Plato's Republic. I didn't know my Greek, and I only know 10%, thanks to your tutelage. I've probably gone from 10% to 12%, but I'm not 1,000% an expert and a uh, um, reader and uh, scholar like you are. I go back to Plato, I go back to Aristotle, I go back to Kant, I go back to Hegel, 
I go all the way up to a guy like Heidegger. And every single one of those characters has done or said in their respective epochal, or to use Foucault's sense, the episteme, the framework of the conditions of the possibility of what's thinkable, sayable, knowable, and seeable. Every single one of these characters has said something so blatantly racist from our definition of what it is, and if it's retroactively transposed onto them, that's okay, that's one thing. Aristotle telling Alexander the Great, you are a Macedonian, I'm Greek, when you go out, he knew he was mentoring the future ruler of, uh, that's going to conquer the, the Eastern world. When you go out there, you're going to treat all the non-Greeks and non-Western peoples as plants and animals, bring back that information to me and classify them. But whenever you see a Greek or a Macedon, you know, whether it's your parents or if it's the royalty or if it's just any other citizen, male, <laughs> Greek, treat them with honor and dignity. That is the root of the mentality. And that goes all the way up to Hegel. And so my final question is, there are plenty of, for me, quite superficial conversations about the diversification of canon. There is something called the historical present where we can actually go back and read these figures against their own grain using tools and techniques of hermeneutic criticism that are racially sensitive, even if we lack a racially diverse faculty as much as we want in the humanities. There are tools and techniques where you can go back to some of these figures, take what you can, deconstruct them, reconstruct what's not being said, and then transpose that in dialogue with a canon that we can push at least from the 20th century, which are black and brown geniuses across so many different fields. Du Bois has to get canonized for me, and Max Weber himself would say this, he is the founding figure of sociology, not Marx, Weber, and Durkheim. The canon teaches you that it's still white and male as we move into the modern era. There are voices we can uplift, and there are collaborations that we could have between black and brown future scholarship, the canon, the small canon that exists of black and brown geniuses in the 20th century in dialogue with this white Western past. So in closing, how much time you wanna take, I'll close up the session. Where are you ethically in terms of the student movements that say, Professor Christensen, thank you for sharing this syllabus and thank you for teaching me Homer, but I have to say, I need this guy out of here. I don't want him to be in the canon. It's the statue. It's the canon. It's the statue. They're synonymous. I don't want to read this guy. I don't want to read, read Ovid and the, the myths and tropes that celebrate rape, you know, from a gender-based violence perspective. And I don't want to hear these thinkers speaking, whether in a philosophically profound way or really a stupid and ignorant and cavalier way about blackness, when you yourself don't know what it's like to be black. How are you handling your... What's your thinking and how are you handling your future planning for, 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 your, for, for your career? I mean, your scholarship I, and your teaching. I think that what, you know, the, the sort of cowardly and easy way out is appeals to universalism, right? Um, which one could make and say talking about the Odyssey. Um, but I think it's a serious question that we need to engage with. Um, and I think one thing is that those of us who are in power, in positions of power, um, need to help chart futures of our disciplines in different directions. Um, and we need to study the, you know, so the global antiquity. We need to rethink the boundaries of the past. Um, and we need to bring in different perspectives to be critically aware of our blind spots um, and, you know, what we don't know. Um, but then I would say, look, um, you're going to cut down the statues. We're not, we don't force everyone to read Homer, uh, but we can't forget the past. And we also need people not everybody, but we need people to critically examine the way that the canon has facilitated the culture that we have and has made it possible. So I think, you know, to go to something simple, like new criticism as an opposed to literature, strips it of its moral and political content and focuses just on its aesthetics. I think when you focus just on aesthetics, you turn the world into a series of objects for your enjoyment. And I think that there's a way in which new criticism is an extension of um, sort of a, a rejection of political conversation and sort of a fascism of appearances. Um, and so I think it's important that intellectuals understand that is history and that those of us who care about the past or think it's worth studying apply the critical lessons we learn from our students. Um, so I think I need to listen when people object. I think I need to be respectful. 
Um, but also understand that a university is a place where many diverse things come into place um, and where hopefully I can be there reshaping and crafting my field for the future. Um, but you're right. I mean, it is an existential question for me as a classicist because there's no doubt that my desire to study Homer was shaped by the very traditions I'm objecting to now. So where does that leave me, right? Is this a red pill moment? Am I coming awake to the world? No, I think that this is a process of understanding the past we received needs much more critical treatment so we can understand it. And the last thing I would say is, look, you got, we all have to understand how the traditions we receive shape us to act in the world for good or for ill. And this can be Homer, but it can also be other traditions as well. Um, so I think critical engagement with the traditions, understanding how they set us up to be racist. Because the ancients were racist in a different way, not quite the same way as sort of you know, moderns. Um, but how do those aesthetic and philosophical traditions make today possible? Mm -hmm. right? How do they set up misogyny? Right? What are the class issues? And so it's about addressing the past with different questions. Um, and then, you know, there's the intellectual history. Du Bois um, was a great classicist. He knew his Latin and Greek, right? And, he was a, um, and I think that the greatest critics of tradition are those who know it well. Not every student needs to be that. Um, but we, we, we can't stop studying the past. We just have to study, study it differently. Before we close, just a, a personal question. Yeah. Feel free how to circumscribe your response. <laughs> Sounds like Tiberius. I command you to be free. <laughs> it's like a ridiculous qualifier on my part to, to even suggest it. Your Gen Alpha kids are going to be in college in 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. You're teaching Generation Zs who are emerging now, and they really are undergraduate collegiate. And you're, you and I teach graduate students as well. And at the youngest scale, they're still the youngest millennials. Millennials are aging. If you were to be sent into a time machine 10 or 15 years from now, what absolutely has to look different in what you do in your current job as a classicist? What absolutely has to look different that you can start thinking about anticipating now? You were touching on it, but I need to push you for it. I mean, I, I think we can't have classical studies departments in the same way. We need ancient studies. Um, I think that we, if we want studying the past to be more just and to be more representative, um, we need to dump the loads of resources into encouraging students of color to do it. Um, and we need to, yeah, we need to break down the boundaries. We need an Africanist in dialogue um, with a Hellenist. We still have not talked about the terrible damage classicists. I mean, some people have but the, the terrible damage classes did to Martin Bernal and Black Athena and just so the denialism that is rampant in the field. Um, we need a more diverse professor, right, to reflect a more diverse student body. Um, and I think we need to change the expectations for tenure radically um, because not only are we shaped by racism, but we're shaped by capitalist racism. Um, and our, this push to produce all the time is a reflex of some of the worst aspects of this, right? Um, as we sort of uh, operationalize uh, everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I want to see different people in the classroom. I want to see different structures. Um, and I want to see different incentives. Um, and, but the thing is, I fear that I'm so shaped by our circumstances and the past of our education systems um, that I can't really imagine what the best change would be. Um, and so that's sort of the thing I muse about. Um, you're still young enough, at least in my perspective. So you have some hope. Capitalism does reproduce hierarchies and conceals it at the same time. And I just say in close, closing as well, those of us that have training in the discipline of philosophy um, and or religious studies, the comparative, the comparative approach is now rising. It takes some disciplines. It's much slower in certain disciplines. You and I know that. But it's reassuring to see rankings of programs, doctoral programs, master's programs, where there's philosophy of race. Yep. There's feminist philosophy, there's Asian philosophy, and it's not about creating hierarchies within those to meet the white Western canon standards about excellence, which can then determine what tenure looks like, as you said, tenure decision. I'm talking about truly comparative philosophies that we shouldn't be ashamed of or put that out on non-philosophical disciplines in the humanities. It's got to come from within. It does. So we need to continue this, uh, this conversation again yes. at a different time. I'm going to go off to students now. Good. Um, <laughs> Take care and come up with two questions to start next time.
Thoroughly right. enjoyable. Thank you, Professor Joel Christensen. Oops. And in closing, I will um, I will see you shortly. I hope we have another session soon. Yeah. Okay. Take care. Bye bye.